and it was featured as one among world top 100 scientists. He is a recipient of the National Medal of Honor and the President's Prize by the Government of Panama 2011. Dr. Lawrence uh, has got research funding around $100,000 for his research topic of development of an APP specific beta secretase inhibitor for Alzheimer's disease therapy in the year uh, 2014. Dr. Lawrence has published in high ranking journals. I just uh, happened to visit the Scholar Google page before I came to this lecture. He has a lot of good citations and he has papers in PNAS and uh, nature uh, drug discovery, nature use drug discovery and so on. I mean it is a model for all of us to emulate. And uh, he is also he serves in many important scientific advisory boards and steering committees including the Zurich Neuroscience Center and the ADPD Scientific Advisory Board. He is the founder of the Facebook platform for the ISCV. He is an associate editor for the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease Journal of Extracellular Recipes and Frontiers in Alzheimer's Disease. He also acts as editor-in-chief of the for the journal Neurodegenerative Diseases. His, his talk honest as the end with this and he may not even find time to complete his profile in this center. And today he is with us to share a few good things about publishing papers in Journal of Matters and he is going to talk about the quality features of the journal. Science Matters, the next generation science journal for civil observation. He is the founder and chairman of Science Matters Journal. Hope we all will uh, enjoy a good brainstorming session and his talk will benefit uh, all of us. Uh, with these few words, I welcome Dr. Lawrence uh, Rajendran and all of you uh, to this program and I request you to take it. Today I am going to talk to you not about the research that we do, but about a very general idea of uh, what defines a good researcher. So we are all, we're all good researchers. What defines us? As, as if you say he's a, he's a good researcher, she's a good researcher. What defines good research? Sorry? Publication. Publication has become, it's, it's very unanimous. You know, they, they, uh, it's hard, there's hardly any debate when you ask this question, what defines a good researcher? Actually, it isn't. Publication is just nothing. If you think about it, uh, papers or manuscripts or publications should be just a means of output. I do research and I'm going to write about it. It's just an output, um, a way of me telling the world that's what I want. And that has got nothing to do with how good I am as a researcher. How good I am as a researcher, it talks about curiosity. It starts with curiosity. It talks about my ability to put the right questions, my ability to, to, to eliminate negative uh, uh, results, my ability to logically interpret it. <clears throat> but none of this actually features because publication, as much as we can, as, uh, as much as we can say that this, this is an output, but it somehow it's an output of all these ideas, all these all these abilities that I can I, I do as a researcher. I put this in the wrong. So one could one does one does see why publications have become such an important component. But um, but as I said, as I said, a long time ago it wasn't, and only as recent as 350 years ago when the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society um, had to uh, face this crisis, so to say, of how do we evaluate all these monographs and books that people write. Uh, I could write my own views, but I wanted, but the librarian wanted somebody else to, to look at it. And that's how the whole peer review system came into existence. And so the current model of publishing, for example, uh, gave rise to quite many, quite many discoveries that that we can read about. So the current system, I'm not going to complain too much about it because this is the exact system that has made advancement in in the knowledge that we have. There is largely a good correlation between impact factor and the breakthrough discoveries. Many, <clears throat> many impactful discoveries 
or published in journals like Nature and Science. So many papers that are uh, uh, papers that are published are not bad, but there are also outliers. There are also papers that that uh, I'll, I'll explain quite a bit that don't seem to be correct. For example, papers that are attracted, they also happen to appear in Nature and Science. So, to some extent, the current publishing system has helped scientific community. But there are a few problems that exist in the current system. And that's why I think, as, as in any innovation, one needs to address what is good in what we have, and what is something, uh, what are the problems that we have and we can address. And there are three things that I want to uh, illustrate today. And the, you know, the first thing that I said is the scientific progress that we made, and that is undeniable. But the second thing is probably most important for people like you is the amount of data that we have. It's the it's <clears throat> it's the sheer volume of the data that we make from the taxpayers' money that we utilize in our research laboratories. We make we we produce a lot of scientific data, but we almost never publish many of them. Most of the data goes um, in a, it gets stored in our textbooks and notebooks and, uh, and, and lab notebooks and most of it gets, um, it never gets to see the daylight of a paper book. We will talk about a lot of, lot of complicated issues as to why this happens. And the second aspect is really this, this irreproducibility in science. And this is an interesting um, a, a, an issue that we have to all discuss. Why do I do science? Um, why do we do science? Of course, it's, it, it begins with a curiosity within ourselves. I want to know things. And then as soon as I find out and I want to publish, it, is, it also forms the... It also forms the... <coughs> the body of knowledge, scientific knowledge. So I'm contributing as an author to the body of science. Which means that that information, that fact, needs to be useful. And if it needs to be useful, it needs to be relevant. It needs to be valid under different circumstances. And so, irreproducibility has become an, a major problem because people couldn't reproduce um, what others have found. Today, when I say that I have found, I have designed an inhibitor of an enzyme that works in Alzheimer's disease. You want to repeat it. You have to reproduce it. And it should work in your hands because I'm going to put that inhibitor if it works very well in a patient. And if it doesn't even work in a lab, laboratory environment, if it doesn't work in other people's hands, how are we sure that it's going to work in, in humans? So this reproducibility aspect is extremely important because it, it, it defines the veracity of the knowledge. And, uh, but but it need not necessarily mean it's always a bad thing because there are there are there are at least two scenarios. In one scenario, that that the system that we might deal with is inherently heterogeneous and varied. So imagine that you work on HeLa cells. It's a very very exciting cell line that a lot of people use. One lab's HeLa cells are not the same as another lab's HeLa cells, and and. And um, so they, that could give rise to heterogeneity in terms of research output. That is something that we can understand. That's the, there is biology behind the variability that you get. So in that way, the irrepro irreproducibility in that is inevitable. But then one needs to understand what the biology behind that aspect is. And so, like human cells are also uh, variable. And so one could think that that this could give rise to certain reproducible results. And that's why we do a lot of optimization, a lot of um, uh, uh, robust validation, for example. We do not only just one cells or one batch, we don't do only technical replicates, but we also do experimental replicates that, that would talk about the robustness of the finding. The second aspect is a much more disturbing one, and that is fraud. Many research institutes knew that these things exist, but we never talked about it. But in the recent years, the amount of studies that get retracted because there is fraudulence in these studies 
because researchers do not always do the right thing. They even uh, um, go to an extent of removing data, for example, or adding data that is not a part of the experiment, has contributed quite a bit to the problems. To some extent, um, to some extent, we can understand why people do do cheat, and to some extent, not. Scientists, as we all know, we don't get so much money. We are not like hedge fund managers, where uh, if you lie, it's actually good for your business. This is about this is about curiously following what the truth is, <clears throat> and so if we cheat. We actually, it isn't good for science, but there are people who do this. And this is concerning, this is very, very problematic things that often seem to have problems. And so this is this paper that you probably all know, this paper has made headlines in many even newspapers that talked about the fact that you can take a cell, put it in an acid and it turns into a stem cell. And then, so stem cell has all the stem cells in the you could use it for therapy, you could use it for whatever it is. And this paper turned out to be uh, a manipulated paper, something that's great. And the, the first author, and probably also the last author, doctor data to sell it, to, 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 to get a nature paper. <clears throat> and so this is the other paper that talked about the fact that um, there's a social a sociological paper that talked about the fact that if um, you live in a community where um, there are people who who are very conservative in the sense that they uh, uh, they do not tolerate homosexual people or you know lesbian uh, people. But if you went and talked to them and you talked to them in terms of raising awareness in the public, then you started to convert them being, into being more tolerant. It's a very interesting paper that has very good sociological implications. That says that we need to raise awareness and talk about uh, um, existence of different sexual, you know, s uh, s uh, people with different sexuality. And it turned out that, that this paper that was published by um, a graduate and his PI from the University of California, Berkeley, uh, this paper was an interesting paper. It was published in Science and it was covered in everywhere, like even in New York Times, for example, saying that it is not a problem that the society, there are, there are people who do not like uh, homosexuals, but it's just that you have to go and educate them, right? <clears throat> it, it's interesting. So, a few students from uh, from Berkeley, they approached this author and said they wanted to have this access to the data that they have so that they can do some uh, sophisticated st statistical tools so that they can reproduce within the data set. And then the first author of this paper said, he cannot give this data because it is about privacy of the people who participated in the interview, which is very good. So the student said, that's very good. Please remove the names of the, of the participants and try to give me uh, just a list without revealing the identity. And he said, he just uh, expunged the data. He just sent, sent the data on file. You know, he deleted the whole set of data. And so that raised suspicion as to when you have an image that comes out of a processed data, where is the data, right? And, um, and so they, they went to Twitter, which is a social networking site, and then, and then said that they don't give the raw data for the paper for which they published in science. And so a friend of mine, who is the, who's also the founder of Retraction Watch, uh, immediately contacted the science editor-in-chief at the time, um, <clears throat> uh, Maria, uh, Maria saying that, that uh, they, they have to, they ha they, if you have published a paper with this raw data, that they would have to, um, uh, they would have to provide this data. And, uh, and so immediately the editor-in-chief of Marisa Mekhan, that uh, she called the, uh, she asked the authors to provide this data. When they couldn't provide the data, this paper was retracted. Because it became very clear that there is something fudgy about this result. And, uh, and this is an extremely interesting study. You know, it was in every newspaper giving hope that, that we could live in a world where it could be more tolerant. But the data didn't, uh, didn't, uh, was not there in order for us to even replicate. 
this is another um, stem cell paper that got retracted and, uh, and, and, and uh, more papers. There are several papers if you go to Retraction Watch. And, and this is the, the one which is at the bottom, is a paper from a good colleague of mine from Columbia University who's, who had a cell paper retracted who had a nature paper retracted. And uh, when I visited him a couple of years ago, he f solely blamed the first author of the paper. Right. So I'm the PI, right? <laughs> and he's the corresponding author of that paper, since it's all faculty, scholars, it's okay to talk about. And, uh, but he conveniently shifts the entire blame towards the first author. So I asked him, would it be okay if when he gets a Nobel Prize, if the first author gets a Nobel Prize, right? If, the sh if you shift the blame, would you also shift the credit? No. And so, uh, uh, and, 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 um, and this is from my, uh, my own study in Zurich, there's another institute uh, in Tehom, where this is a very decorated plant science biologist who is incredibly smart, who who is somebody who know what the data implies. So you look at the data and then you know that's the storyline, that, that it's going to be there. And it's just that the sign, the students have to prove it. You know. It's going to be like this. I know it. The data says this. You just have to show me experimental data to prove the hypothesis. Any of us have this. And, um, and it turned out that he is kind of right. So many of his studies are not not wrong in the sense that they are fundamentally wrong that he just manipulated the data. But the data seemed to imply what he says. However, the problem was that in order to provide experimental proof, sometimes the controls don't work. They, they, they look different. And so what he would do in, when the reviewers were to ask these, ask um, evidence for, for, for uh, some of these hypotheses, he would actually take plots or, or images of plots that did not belong to this experiment, but then would fit it so that it, it belonged to that experiment. He had a folder in his, in his computer called loading controls. So if, uh, if you had an experiment, you could just run it and then put a loading control without even doing it for a four lane or a 10 lane uh, uh, gel. And so these are not, I mean, I'm just trying to tell you the kind of the kind of um, uh, fraudulence that occurs. But these are all papers that, that, retract, that it's retracted. And, um, and, uh, and, um, and a reviewer for his, one of his papers in science uh, raised some critical points when he submitted a paper to science and saying like these images are not, there some, they seem to be something wrong with these images. The, the bands seem like it's rotated 180 degrees. And, uh, and, and then the paper got retract, uh, re rejected from science. And then so eventually it got published in an in, uh, in EMBO journal. And so she went to a site called Papier and then raised these questions, which then started the debacle of his career. And uh, this is an interesting image you can see. This is the single kind of experimental data that was published in three different journals by a Malaysian group. And, um, and, and you can see here the authors try to, to demonstrate that, um, that different cells in different cell cycle stages have different uh, shapes or they maintain. And so the reviewers asked, it's not, it's not good if they showed only one image. But they would have to show many images. And so they showed here. Do you see? What the authors did is not they didn't go and do more experiments or take more images, but they actually digitally cut this cell and then paste it here and here and here. You wouldn't notice it because it's a beautiful Photoshop. It's almost like modern art that, that you can see here that they digitally clone these cells to say, if the reviewer says, show me more, here I am, I show you more. Them together, probably. Yes, the 
there one place. That's right. They need to do some kind of image analysis. Right. So now there are many um, journals that do image. Um, have is, if there is a what they do is that they enhance the contrast and see, for example, if the background has been uh, if, the, if the background image has different contrast. In that way, you would know if it has been cut and pasted in a black background. And 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 uh, it used to be some kind of an insider information. If you belong to a university, if you belong to an institute, we used to know or we used to hear things that that lab has somebody who does these things. Um, not anymore is the case. A lot of people know and uh, now there are t several digital tools that would enable to see fraudulence. And, uh, and um, the, the fraudulence goes from one end like this to the other end, which some of us are also guilty of. One is even cutting corners, for example. If a reviewer asks for an experiment proof, and if it turned out to be negative, or turned out to be the other way around, we don't show it. Right? If you have a hypothesis that goes in this direction, and you test them, and then it turns out to be negative, we don't include it in the paper because we want to, we want to tell a very smooth story. We can't say things anymore that I did this, it could happen, that this is a possibility, but then when I looked into the possibility, it turned out to be negative because it's not of interest to people. People somehow are attracted to positive <coughs> results. We are, in, we are, we are somehow attracted and, and, and enticed by the possibility that we can cure diseases. We somehow like this idea that that uh, you know you have discovered a new thing, uh, and and as a result, if you look at papers that get published, most of the papers are positive, and it's also guilty in terms of when it comes to clinical trials, for example, when when people register to make clinical trials, if it is positive, they report; if it is negative, they just keep it quiet. And so this reporting, for example, is the same in terms of scientific, scientific research. So that is something that we have to think about. And, um, and the fraudulence also goes in a different way, is that the authors, when they submit to journals, they, in certain <coughs> journals, you can, uh, you, can you can kind of recommend who should review and who shouldn't review. And so there are a group of journals that, that found both from the NCB as well as the um, the, the you know, BMC journals track down this this criminal activity that the scientists did is that they put their own names not this name the right name but they gave fake names but then they made email addresses to these fake names and then made themselves reviewers of their own paper right so they they would uh, recommend their some of these names like you know whatever. Uh, Lawrence or the University of Zurich, but then give the email address something that goes to, to them. And so many, many authors reviewed their own papers. Right. And uh, so this is this is another shade of fraudulence that exists. And there is another fraudulence that occurs is that a group of scientists from a university will, will um, found their own journal, right? And then they would review each other's papers and, uh, and, and cite each other's paper. And so it's a lot shades of these fraudulent claims that exist in, in, in the system. And I'm not here to, to find faults, but I'm just listing these things that occur. And uh, one thing that I ask is not really, really what can we do about it? Shall we just, shall we, um, uh, can we do anything about it? And, and as I said, the, the, the gone are the days where it used to be this insider information. And now almost everyone knows that not all scientists are honest. And in the sense that not all published literature can be completely trusted. That there are people who, whose data are not reliable. And that there are scientific papers that have been retracted because there is a problem with it. And this, these are economists, for example, covered it on their cover, saying how science goes wrong. And now there are many, many, many. If you Google uh, fraudulence in science or science goes wrong, 
to find have many articles. And so this has been a, a, a focus and in the last few years about irreproducibility and the problems in scientific publishing. White has a state of notice and many, I don't know if you remember, if you can recognize John Oliver, who used to be with John Stewart, and who makes his own late night shows. And he talked about how scientific studies are fraudulent and how scientists cheat in, uh, dur during selling their own, own scientific literature. And um, this irreproducibility is not, just, uh, is, is not just for the sake of getting papers. It's not just the case. Because <clears throat> when you ask why people cheat, why do people behave the way they do in the terms of, in, in, in the negative terms, one, one quickly comes to this conclusion that there are incentives to do this. It is not that that my human nature, that without an incentive, I'm going to behave uh, in this way. But there is an incentive. So in in um, if you look at recruitment of faculty, if you look at grants for faculty, if you look at tenure to awards, for example, everything comes down to what number of papers you have and where you have published. Almost. It's not anymore the case that you you are rewarded for who you are as a, as a scientist, but it's mostly about what kind of papers you have. So, this, this, so if you had a nature or a science and, and this kind of papers, then you get to, you have you had so, so much and so um, impact factor papers published, then you get a faculty position. And of course there's, there's this desire to get that. There's this honest way of getting it. And there is another way of getting it. And, and so I'm, I'm not saying just about the scientists, but I'm also trying to tell you how the environment that we live in encourages this kind of behavior. And, and uh, it is not just about the personal interest. But due to this fact that we, um, due to the, this immense pressure to publish and to get this, the work published in high ranking journals, we, some, some amount of compromise has been reached and that, that some data that have been published are not entirely correct. And that can translate up to 22 billion dollars per year towards the irreproducibility of this if a Nobel laureate publishes a paper in Nature saying that this is the target of Alzheimer's disease, right? Uh, this is the Nobel laureate from Rockefeller who published a paper in Nature in 2010 saying that this protein could be a target for Alzheimer's disease. Many companies want to take that as, as a verbatim knowledge, right? That that is a fact. And you go and establish, put, put 20 people in Basel, Switzerland, Roche company and say, find that, find a drug against this company. Target. And this is a new biomarker for prostate cancer. Let's just try to figure out, you know, an antibody-based detection system. So we put in a lot of money in terms of uh, um, resources into into projects based on academic publications. And later on, they turned out that they turned out to be not reproducible, or they didn't come out in a way that's so. And this is something that you all know that. Uh, this is the struggle that we talk about. That there is this huge struggle in terms of, of um, what it requires to publish. And that when you get it, you, you really get rewarded. And these are the people who are like the gatekeepers of the quality of science. And, um, <clears throat> and, and, and this is already here is a problem. In order to get it submitted, you need to make a story that can, that, that, that can be submitted and once you submit, of course the peer review uh, uh, comes into play and they ask you more and more experiments and it takes a while to get it published. And, uh, and this publish or perish culture that exists in, the, in, in science um, does something, does many things bad. But one important thing that we have to consider quite, quite much is it, it is is the view that the young scientists have. Several years ago, when we were asked what makes what you why do you want to go to science, 
It's not really about publication, but really about curiosity. That you want to know things. And today I ask questions in the, in the, in, in, among students, and they also said many, many said. Uh, in the, in the, predominantly in the U.S., the Nature conducted this uh, survey that, that said, in many labs, the incentives to be first, right? to say things first, is much more exciting and more lucrative and more, uh, it, it had more value than saying it correct. It's pretty much the same thing as fake news that, that goes around. Jayanta has no legs on it, you know, that you come out first with some news. Uh, that, that has this virality, that has the seeding potential of, of, um, of, of impact, so to say, as opposed to a good journalism that requires time in order to investigate and to make sure that it is right. And, um, and this, is the, 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 this is where we are heading, where our own research scholars think that it's more important to get a paper first, to get it out first, than to be right. And so that affects many levels of quality and reproducibility, and also comfort and confidence in the way that we produce. <coughs> And um, this is the final slide in terms of introduction there. That 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 when you look at the 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 barriers that I talk about, the barriers to create knowledge, it's really the fact that you have you start with an observation, you start with the finding, but then in order to publish, you need to make it into a story, to a good story that goes into this journal. And and we think that this is this could be a problem. That, um, that 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 uh, uh, this could be a major problem that could underline this entire um, the, the structural problem that we talk about. That stories somehow have taken priority, other than facts. Very early on, in the 1970s to 1950s, that that you used to have journals where they would publish in bi biochemical journal to JVC, for example. You say purification of an enzyme or isolation of an enzyme, part one. And the part two, you will come after some time, it's called uh, purification of characterization, biophysical characterization. Gone are those days. In today's world, you can't publish observation. You would have to put them in a context of a story. In the, you, you have to package them, and then it has to be smooth. You cannot have rough edges. If, if, if you cannot say, you cannot describe things that could in some in, 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 in the future could give rise to certain things. Today it has to be round edged <coughs> stories. And um, and and and, and uh, if you are Alexander Fleming, for example, or if you have an Alexander Fleming in your lab, where you make this amazing discovery or an observation, you come to the lab and there is a mold growing on a bacterial plate, and you think that that voila, that's it, right? That's it. This eureka moment that you see that it can, it can wipe out bacterial diseases <coughs> and you see that this has, a, this has enormous impact. Now you start to publish. And you go to a journal and say, look, all that I find is that whenever I go this particular mold uh, onto bacterial plate, it always kills. So I think this has huge impact for medicine. And today, if you have to publish, in 1927, Alexander Fleming published pretty much that. He published one single observation in that journal saying, uh, this is, he never even isolated penicillin in that paper. So he, he calls penicillin, he never isolated or synthesized penicillin. And today in, in, in any journal you go, say things like, this is the observation that I do, Suddenly, immediately the peer reviewers ask you questions like, what is it? Is it a lipid? Is it a, what's the compound? You have to isolate it. You would have to structurally characterize the compound. You have to. The most most important thing that they they like, uh, the peer reviewers like, is that you have to identify the mechanism that to which this action happens. And then, if you aim for science or nature, you would have to cure half a population of Africa to, to demonstrate that this works. Today, scientific publishing publishing works in this way that you have to have not just observation but extensions of observations and findings, and that you tell a very coherent story in, in order to tell some new stuff. And we think that is a real problem. That's a real problem more so for people like us here. Because when, um, 
in order to develop a, a, an observation into a story, you need resources. You need human resources. You need people. You need money. You need expertise, for example. And many a times, uh, you're not a chemist. You don't have chemists in your, in your department, for example. You would have to go somewhere else. And so, and, and so you can't publish these valuable observations anymore. And as a result, things do get stuck. Many PhD students make fantastic observations, go out and learn a paper. Master students come and make inter uh, uh, you know, um, uh, projects uh, interns, as interns now in my lab. They, they don't get to, get to publish because they can't, there's no time to make a story out of these observations. So I think, uh, I, 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 I hope you see the point that I, I try to make, is that we've come very far away from what actually defines science. Define, science was defined really about by observing, them, being curious and observing things and then building questions on it as opposed to just packaging and selling stuff. And, uh, and so we think uh, the solution, the good solution could be not really to go on this witch hunt and saying like you're bad, you're bad, you're bad, but really uh, 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 trying to figure out whether we can create an ecosystem, an atmosphere where scientists can, uh, uh, that does not require to be dishonest. So you're rewarded for being honest. And, um, and, and, and it's a very complex solution. And uh, the complex solution, I don't think we could have a complex solution for a, for a complex problem. There could be a complex solution. We think that there's one aspect that we can address is by, by allowing people to publish observations. So, as I told you, the whole narrative here, I hope you, 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 you could appreciate the importance of observation. And that is something that nobody can take away from it. You probably are not, uh, be a, you know, um, I don't have the expertise in making CRISPR-mediated transgenic animals, but I have a st strong uh, uh, an observation that I find in my field, and I should be able to publish this. And so we, we now started the Science Matters as a journal for the first time that you could actually start to publish single observations without the need of a storyline. And, and, and um, many people claim this is, this is super innovative and new and all that stuff, but it actually goes back several years. You can, you can, you can see here, many people capitalized on the importance of observations. When you look at how things are published, and even in nature and science, it used to be a single observation journal. You clone a gene, you identify a protein, you do a mutation, it used to be this single observation. Today, now you have to tell a story. You would have to cure cancer in almost every paper that you, you publish. You have to cure Alzheimer's disease. So the sensational, sensationalizing uh, scientific studies have become some kind of a norm in order to get into these journals. And we think that it is not necessary. And, um, and so Matters is this journal that we, we, we created where uh, um, you are allowed to publish, um, that you can publish only single observation. Let's say the Alexander Fleming story, that, that you don't know what the compound is, but every time you, you grow the, the mold on this bacterial plate, you take different mold, you take different bacteria, you heat, but you, you, you're around that one observation that you have enough controls and you have enough um, uh, uh, samples and every time it looks like the mold actually gets back. That's a great finding and that does not require decoration or, 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 or um, you know, a, too much extension. And so that you publish and so you can, uh, if you go to Science Matters website, you will see that we have made a fantastic editor. It doesn't require you to do um, to have uh, Microsoft Word, for example. You can just write it on an internet-based platform. It's called What You See Is What You Get. Talent. And the reason that I did is that through this race rural program that that I have, when I, when I visited many rural uh, institutes, people use pirated versions of Microsoft. All right. Uh, it's not the pirated version of I don't know a, a game that you can play. But it's for research, but actually more for for um, true curiously, you know, curiosity-driven researchers that 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 this could aid in publishing papers before they are, you know, um, 
a fully matured research certificate to, to be ready for uh, fuller directors. And, and uh, that is the, the scientific advisory board, the chair of the scientific advisory board is Tom Sudok, you probably know, who got the Nobel Prize for, uh, in 2013. And there are several people who are uh, who are there. And also, editorial uh, board has, we have around now 700, 700 members in the editorial team. And uh, if you are willing to serve on the editorial board because you have an expertise in the certain field, please, please send me an email. I'll be very happy to include you. But also publish um, in this new journal. So we we uh, we just got indexed with Google Scholar. We will now go for indexing in PubMed and Scopus. And uh, we will also apply for an impact factor that uh, that um, that is important in the sense that that uh, people would ask, like, you know, why should I publish in journal? Uh, but but really fundamentally, I think we need to change the way the science publishing game is happening. Not necessarily just that just because there is this artificial barriers to publish. But the other side of the coin that I didn't talk about is the, the problem with access of knowledge. These publishing, um, this predatory way of publishing uh, says that by increasing this threshold to publish, we put barriers to publish. You need to have a sexy story, it needs to be fuller, it needs to have animal models in vivo to whatever stuff. It, it takes a lot of time and then it needs to happen. But then once you contribute to the knowledge uh, 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 base, then to access knowledge, your own paper, if it is published in the city or journal, right? you paid money, you, the taxpayers paid money, paid money, and then they use their money to make research. And we try to publish, and it's already problematic. And then once you publish, you would have to pay publication charges. And then you publish in these journals in order to access you would have to have, your library has to subscribe uh, money to this, right? So you would have to have $32 to access. And this is this predatory way, it's called this uh, paywall to access, that kills many uh, uh, many researchers because the, the access to knowledge is in So we we think that, that in 2017 or in, in 2000, it shouldn't be the case, so Science Paris is completely open access. And uh, and it's it's free at the moment to, to publish, and, and we are going in the way of platinum access, which means that um, authors should it should be free for researchers to not only access but also to to pay to, to publish. But um, then the funding body should take over the charges of publishing. Right like now, it's the researchers who have to pay from their grant money and their pocket money, which is not correct. It should be the scientific. Funding so we're trying to lobby with the European Commission and also to the Swiss National, the Swiss National Science Foundation to, to to many different science foundations. Perhaps we should also talk to the Barnabas University to DST, uh, saying that they, if they take care of the publishing costs, then uh, um, research becomes freely accessible, not only to 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 access knowledge but also to create information. So that's pretty much it is. And, and these other papers that we published, as you can see here. It's um, <clears throat> this is one figure where you describe where you describe um, uh, what you've done, and uh, if you go into the website, you clearly see um, uh, the, the structure of the paper. And this is a paper that I talked about. It came from my lab, and um, it, it, it refutes the claims of the Nobel laureate from uh, Rockefeller that talked about a new plot, and we couldn't uh, we couldn't reproduce the data. And, and so these could all help in terms of reproducibility of, of, uh, of research findings. And, uh, and at the end, it's, uh, yeah. So the, the, the motto is that stories can wait, science can, science matters. And so I guess that um, by having disruptive technologies and innovations, in, in the science publishing domain, maybe we could move into an era where where these could contribute to the big data of science and knowledge. And um, most of the knowledge now is sitting in our desk drawers, so we could just put them out in. And one way would be to to publish observations the way that it was done. So, thank you very much for listening.
Um, at the moment, it's 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 really focused on life sciences, natural sciences. So you can be published in biological sciences, chemical sciences, physical sciences, and we expand in in the future to humanities and social sciences. But who should publish? Who can publish? So if you are a scientist and if you have a research grant, you can publish. But if you are a if you are visiting. Let's say I come and visit your lab and I have this data, and like I see your data, can I publish? No, I can't because we do ask whether the grant was, was um, the funding was granted to your lab. Because otherwise if it's a single observation, anybody can take the data and then publish for us. So it's not everyone or anybody can publish, but, but people who, who have um, uh, uh, funding that is granted to them can publish. The second uh, is we move towards um, uh, in 2017, towards probably the end, we will have a matters journal called Citizen Matters. That is a completely different way where uh, curious citizens, let's say you go on a hiking trip, you, you see something uh, interesting that could be of interest to scientists, let's say. Uh, you see a new kind of looking flower, so to say, or a, a rock formation that has never been there, but you can document it. Can, you can document and then publish with, with matters. But that is in a different domain called citizen matters. But here it's it's research scholars. And another question is like, uh, whether uh, you are a That's a very good question. A, you know, what do we consider as a data as, as a data set that um, is significant? I think significance actually is uh, it, we don't we don't think that 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 should be a criteria for publication uh, unless it's a statistical significance. So if, as long as your data is statistically significant and technically well done, it should be published. It really, I think. I go in the direction that every data that that defines something should be published as long as it is statistically as statistically correct and valid. But whether it is important, whether this is this has some uh, relevance to humanity, to mankind, to whatever it is, I think time will tell. Uh, I, most of the, I, most of Einstein's works, people didn't uh, see the potential of it, and, and now hundred years later we see that this helps us solve bigger questions like uh, gravitational waves, for example, making lasers, for example. And that is something, if somebody would have asked Einstein or people, what is this significance? What is the significance of all this, all these numbers and equations? Uh, that, is, that is irrelevant in the sense that, that as long as um, uh, I, I contribute to knowledge and um, I'm good, that, that's, that's how it should be. So, we shouldn't put barriers on what should be published as long as it's it's um, it's it's valid as long as it's um, well executed. The data set is not uh, not dirty. But the corporate size, corporations which are you know most of the fraudulence is happening, most of the senselessness is happening with the support of the corporations. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering to know when you started this uh, innovative uh, program. Uh, uh, so, how uh, did you see that the support is coming? Uh, or did you find, you know, did you face any criticism from, you know, we are working out totally different model to the already existing model of publication? I guess the, the, we do have competitors. Yeah, you know, we're, we're not entirely happy that we have, a, we have come up with it. But a large part of scientists along this area. A large, I mean, we have testimonials if you go to the website, you can just we find that many, many sites, like it could be young versus old, they love this idea that I don't have to to make a story or make up a story. So this is this is great that I don't I can just honestly describe what I find and then I can come back and extend my scientific curiosity uh, developed experiments. Right. So in that way, it seems like that's the logical thing to do. 
but of course, like uh, some uh, haters will always be there, and that's okay to, to 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 have it because that also makes you consider what should be done better. Like the the criticism, for example. On one hand, it it's good. On the other hand, it's also that that um, maybe the other journals also should do this. Yeah, that's certain. This is a fantastic model. But then the already established dominant model yeah, yeah. is actually in the yeah. other way around, yeah. as you already pointed out. And they, and they, and the thing is, really, scientists also like to tell a story. We all like to tell stories, and so we do see that as much as people love this idea, they also want to keep that story for themselves. Mm. They don't want to put one uh, this single observation so that your uh, the, the novelty is compromised for a for a larger uh, story, which is okay. Yeah, I'm very happy that you are going back to the you know curiosity model yeah. from the result result oriented model. Mm. This result oriented model is actually a corporate supported model, but the curiosity model is actually not that. You have to go back to the pre corporatization of science. Right. right. For this single observation investigation, we help you to reduce the dishonesty in scientific community because uh, yeah, single observation yeah. Yeah, yeah, can maybe. Can magnitude the observation, you know, yeah. the wrong observation, maybe the false observation. So one thing. The second thing, the peer review itself it's a bad idea. That's right. Yeah. Why can't you put uh, maybe it may be yeah. uh, so it has some seven hundred reviewers. Yeah. For example, more than fifty percent reviewers say yes, it's one click. So it can be published uh, without going for uh, blind or uh, open review, basically. Because the, everyone, whatever people uh, review there will be some kind of biased <coughs> mechanism in the You know, so the first point is that would the single observation reduce dishonesty? I think it does. But, I mean, there would be always people who, who would misuse the system. That's human nature. That's okay to, to deal with miscreants. And, and that's, that's, that's like, it's an inevitable part of the society. Um, but I think largely, if you're allowed to say one thing, why would you want to say something which is not correct? And um, the second thing is is very interesting. Can uh, can we crowdsource here? Right? That's what you say. If you have seven hundred, and maybe in ten years we have hundred thousand reviewers in our database. And uh, can we make a Tinder like um, you know Tinder? It's just this app where yeah. if you find the person yeah. attractive, you swipe right. If not, uh, uh, left. Right. That's how Swayamra has come to so you, you, you swipe, swipe right or left in choosing your partner. And so we could also do that. So you, you look at the data and say, does it appeal to me, does it not appeal to me? We think that we are a bit too early for this. Because we are not into nano um, publication, but it's still a single observation publication. which requires that you read the paper, you talk, you think about it. Is the data correct for this <coughs> Um, so I think that peer review in this form is extremely important. Uh, but I completely understand that peer review is bad because it has corrupted the system. It's like equated to democracy that sometimes you elect Trump, sometimes you elect you elect um, you know Obama. What is good or what, what is bad is not something that I I am qualified to say. But that's the best form of government we have in terms of um, evaluating quality of people. It's There are journals, for example, called Faculty 1000 that just allows you to put out data uh, and, and paper before it's even reviewed. Right? So it's called open review or post publication review. We feel that as a scientist, I need to exercise some form of control, some form of um, of quality assurance before I let out an information to, to go into the base, database of knowledge. I don't want another Google to be created where you just type in something and then there is like there is millions of pages of data, of results, but you have peer reviewed results. So as a result, this is one thing that you're, you're confident that this peer review will work. It could it be better, it could be longer. It could be not just two reviewers that we use, it could be five reviewers swiping left to right, but also looking at the If you are going to have a finalist, the 
the reviews, for example, are all published. So you can look at the review or comment and also the scores that they give. And it's published along with the, uh, the paper. Yeah. Do you but publish in silico papers? Yeah. Uh, we do, we do. There are two papers that we published. We do, we do publish. Nowadays, uh, for us, people who are in the bioinformatics stream, we find it very difficult to publish even papers, I mean journals where they generally publish, now they ask us to validate because many times because of funding crunch, even though we do docking, we like in the yeah. discovery, we did something for EJ for editors, but uh, at least two journals they have returned uh, papers, they say you validate, validate. But it's, I mean part of the program we don't have funds, so we cannot really do any inhibitor as well. That's the thing, uh, the peer review when we talked about, it has these two parts, at least two parts. It used to be only one, which is to say, to see whether what you say is correct. Yeah, whether it is scientifically valid then it or is not. Right. Yeah. So it used to be that way. Whether our model or our approach or interpretation of data is right, that, that's the, that should be the peer review system. Right. Now they say you prove experimentally, but that is not part of our... That's uh, right. That's right. That's right. That's, this, these extensions is what we don't ask. So maybe the, they are bothering about their journal's impact factor and other things that forces even the reviewers to say yeah. uh, it is happening. Now Mattis doesn't ask for extensions. If it is an incidental paper, we ask the reviewers to evaluate exclusively on, the, on what, you have, what you claim that you have done. Um, but we, we would ask for more simulations or more number of iterations for example. But we don't ask for extensions. But if you provide an extension, then it can go higher in the scoring, for example, in Madison. But technically, if it is well done, you use the right program, and it's, it, looks, it looks good. There's no reason why we shouldn't publish. I got a quick question. Is it like uh, when we submit a paper in the sometimes we have a So those papers are being read by the experts. Yeah. And if it is really not. Thank you. Now my request, Dr. Pease. My pleasure to propose a whole thanks in the Department of Bioinformatics. Uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, it's my <laughs> pleasure for being with us. Thank you for uh, giving a wonderful presentation. Your presentation remembered me the Thomas Alva Edison's book, Thousand Ways to Not Get Success. By seeing you are problems in the campus. By eliminating all those problems, definitely uh, every scientist can get a very good publication in their uh, respective fields. So I want to thank you for your wonderful presentation. Apart from that, I want to thank the university administration, our vice chancellor, registrar, for permitting me to conduct all these events in our university with the fullest of freedom. And second, I want to thank my head of the department as soon as I communicated the information that Professor Lawrence is coming for uh, giving an invited lecture in our university. He immediately accepted my uh, request and uh, provided all the facilities to conduct this event. And uh, I want to thank him for the success, but, but unfortunately he is not uh, able to present over here. And I want to thank Dr. Selvaraj for his present, taking all the responsibilities in behalf of our head of the department. Also I want to thank the NFMC director for providing this hall. And I want to thank all the faculty members in the NFMC because Professor Prabhakar and came personally inside the hall and investigated everything is working properly or not. And then I want to thank uh, my colleagues and the colleagues from our super assistant departments, my research scholars and my guest faculties, students, researchers of our Bharat Dasan University. Uh, last but not least, I want to thank my wife Dr. Anusha Devi Jayachandran for uh, introducing uh, Dr. Lawrence to me because uh, she is the one no, Dr. Lawrence, uh, before to me, because they are collaborators, they are doing uh, scientific discussions very frequently. So I thank everyone for this uh, even big success. Thank you. Thank you.